This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we enter the sanctuary, greet and fellowship with one another. Find a visitor, extend friendship. Then as the prelude begins, please remain silent as the time to focus on the honor of worship. Street United Methodist Church. Please register your attendance uh, in the pew pad and then send it back down so people can see who you are. There are uh, many, many announcements, and I'm going to touch base on a few, but you want to say something? Absolutely. Uh, thank you. I want to welcome everyone, of course, uh, to our service and want to welcome our guest preacher today. Uh, he'll be preaching in a few minutes. Uh, the Reverend Bruce Stanley uh, started out, uh, I knew him as my pastor when I was a, a young fella uh, growing up at Eden Street United Methodist Church. He was our associate pastor, and uh, he went on to uh, lead uh, many other churches, including uh, ones in eastern North Carolina like Hampstead uh, United Methodist and others that, uh, that you will probably know. Uh, and then he was the, uh, became president of Methodist Home for Children, and he's going to tell us about that and about their ministry, but uh, he will surely inspire us. Uh, too. I've, I've had the benefit of uh, preaching, of being in his services as a, as a, as a, as a parishioner and as a, a friend, as a pastor too, and uh, he is an exquisite preacher. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing from you today. And of course, he's the inspiration for where I'm trying to go with my hair, so that's also uh, that's okay. Tighten it, up. <laughs> Tighten it up a little bit, that's right. Thank you. This announcement is not in your bulletin. Uh, Loaves and Fishes will have their fourth annual benefit. 
barbecue and chicken plates uh, hosted by Fat Fellas. The date is Friday, October the 13th. Parking uh, in front of the Loaves and Fishes uh, on the, in the Roses Shopping Center. Cost is $10 and tickets will be at the church. Some of the announcements, and please read your bulletin, it, it is full of them. Uh, the Thanksgiving dinner uh, is on November the 23rd, which is always a big deal for us. Uh, come one, come all. Uh, please bring a covered dish, and if you have any questions, talk to Carrie Smith. The Ladies Fall Bazaar is also a very large deal. It is October the 21st. The flood bucket supply deadline is October the 1st. Well, uh, yes, please be sure to bring in supplies for the flood buckets and uh, we'll take anything that you can bring that um, is on the list. And even if it's something that you think will be helpful that's not on the list, uh, we'll figure out uh, what to do and how to help, help get it where it needs to be. Obviously, uh, people uh, for in, in our country and, and, and nearby territories uh, all suffering so much uh, from this flooding. And uh, let us also be praying for the people affected by earthquakes in Mexico. And fires. Yes, yes, sir. Mm. <laughs> Please stand for the call to worship. After that, we will have the passing of the peace. Give thanks to God and call on Christ's name. Thank grace and sing God's praise. Seek the Lord who is here with us now. We rejoice in God's glory and strength. Passing of the peace.
go. Good morning. And we'll start off with number 467, Trust and Obey. And we'll follow that with 526. What a friend we have in Jesus. Take a request from the congregation. 369. And as we sing this, I would invite the children to come forward for the children's sermon to follow. Again, number 369. like candy? If you, if you like candy, raise your hand. You like candy? You don't like candy? <laughs> well, I tell you what, I like, oh, I know you like candy. <laughs> but I like candy, regrettably. No matter if your favorite color, you ever heard of M&M's? Bag of M&M's with all the different colors in it? Sure. Uh, no matter if your favorite color is red, yellow, blue, green, or brown, there is something for everyone in a bag of M&Ms. In the same way, God's goodness satisfies all of our needs. Now, there is a story or a parable uh, about feeding the 5,000. And it is Matthew 14, 13 through 21. I'm going to read this in my old Bible. I read this old Bible every morning. And when I was brought into the church, I was given this Bible in 1957. That's 60 
years ago. And I think that's when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. <laughs> but this is the story about feeding 5,000 people. That's more than people that live in Beaufort. I mean, that's a slew of folks. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into the desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place. And it is time now for the multitudes to go away and to their individual building, uh, villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said unto him, They need not depart, give ye them to eat. And they said, All we have are five loaves and two fishes. So that means five loaves of bread and two little old fishes. That's not much to feed 5,000 people. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit on the grass, and he took the five loaves, five loaves of bread, and two fishes, and he blessed and brake and gave loaves to his disciples and the disciples of the multitude. And they did eat and were filled, and they took up the fragments that remained, and they had 12 baskets left. So two little old five loaves of bread and fishes. They fed 5,000 people, and they had food left over. I think that's pretty slick. And they, after they had eaten, there were 5,000 men besides women and children. What that says to me, kids, is that through God and through Jesus, anything is possible. I mean, if you can feed 5,000 people with five little old loaves of bread and two fishes, there's something to it. So thank you very much for coming down, and y'all are good-looking boys. Bye. See ya. The Old Testament lesson today is a reading from the Old Testament, Genesis 18, 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Merom, and he sat at the entrance of the tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed on the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, wash your feet, rest yourselves under the tree, let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves and afterwards you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said, and Abram, Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, took, the calf, took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set it before them. He stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. 
So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, should I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? And say, Shall I indeed bear, bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, Oh, yes, you did laugh. Good morning. It's a, a pleasure and privilege to be with you all. It's especially a pleasure and privilege for me to be with Taylor, uh, who uh, is as he has always been, uh, which is good and faithful and a wonderful leader, not just here, but uh, also in our conference, and a dear friend. I also know he's an Appalachian State fan and hurting over a blocked field goal yesterday. <laughs> And uh, 20 to 19, I don't know about you, but I'd rather lose by a lot than a little because it, if it's going to hurt, I'd, I'd rather just have it over with and be done. Uh, Methodist Home for Children in a given year is going to serve about 1,600 uh, children, youth, and their families. Uh, with intake and discharge, another way that you can run the numbers is that uh, on any given day, uh, when you're putting your head on the pillow uh, at night, uh, you can take some comfort in that our United Methodist Church has had in its care during that day over 400 children, youth, and their families. Uh, we uh, work all across the state of North Carolina. We're an official ministry of the North Carolina Conference, but we run, as the state does, uh, from Manio to Murphy. Uh, we have 12 residential facilities, including one in the western part of the state in Macon County, uh, in the county seat of Franklin, and you can see Georgia from there. And the uh, closest facility we have here is that we've got a group home in Newburn. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, with uh, in-home services, with family preservation, family reunification, uh, in-home with foster care, treatment foster care. Last year we had 26 adoptions uh, out of the foster care system, uh, children who found a forever family. We're the largest operator for the state of North Carolina for the Division of Juvenile Justice for residential programs uh, for offenders that are therapeutic alternatives to them being sent to prison. And if you're wondering, why don't I know more about Methodist Home for Children, uh, those would be some of the reasons why, is that we don't have a central campus, and most of the work that we do uh, is protected by HIPAA and other regulations, and so we need your help uh, in a variety of ways in order to serve these children. You know whom it is that we serve. I don't need to tell you the nature of these children. What percentage of these children come from homes in which there's family fracture and only one functioning parent? What percentage? High, very high. About 80, about 80%. 80 what percentage of them are coming from homes in which there's substance abuse, either their own, their parents, or multi-generational? Yeah, somebody said 70. It's about 75% of the children are coming from homes in which there's uh, substance abuse, their own or parents. Uh, how about homes in which there's cyclical poverty and low educational attainment historically? Yeah, up, we're upward of 80%, probably closing in on 90. I don't need to tell you what our children are like. Uh, you know, the, these are the, uh, the poor and the marginalized. We need three things from you, and since we're Trinitarian Christians, I'm on firm ground when I'm asking for those three. First thing we need for you is we need you to pray for us. And I don't say that formally or perfunctorily, uh, but each morning uh, when you're being a good Methodist and being methodical about your approach to God and reading your scripture and, and saying some prayers, uh, don't neglect to, to pray for our children, for the families that care for them, for the clinical workers, for those who do administrative work. The needs of these children when they come into our care are frequently daunting. And quite frankly, without the power of the Holy Spirit, we can't be sustained and their lives can't be transformed. So do not neglect to pray for each one of these. We also need for you to be a witness. When I tell people uh, that I work at Methodist Home for Children, I get two immediate responses. The first one is, is warmth. Oh, that's wonderful. And then the second one is bewilderment. What is that? And, and what's Methodist Home do? 
I'm going to challenge you to uh, go online to our website, and it's the initials of the organization, mhfc.org, and get a box of Kleenex and sit and watch some of the uh, stories uh, told by some of the people we serve in our own words and educate yourself as much as you can. And when somebody asks you what you do this weekend, don't tell them that the weather was awesome. Don't tell them you went out in your boat or went fishing or golfing. Say, you know, I learned something this weekend and uh, walk through that door, and we need for you to be a voice for us and to be an advocate for children. And the final thing from you, we need financial support. Um, for each one of these 1,600 children, youth, and their families that we're going to serve in the course of a year, we've got to raise about that same amount of money to cover the true cost of care. We are a wonderful public-private partnership in which we leverage a lot of state and county dollars, uh, but without you, the peanut butter does not go all the way across the bread. Uh, we began a marketing campaign several years ago to help promote this gap, and we call it 1K for One Kid because Methodists tend to be hardworking and diligent. Uh, I've never spoken to a congregation irrespective of size, in which there wasn't somebody who could stroke 1K for one kid and write a check themselves out of what God had blessed them with and not even miss it. Because Methodists also tend to be open and inviting. I'm sure that I've never spoken to a congregation where there wasn't somebody who had that desire in their heart, but it was well beyond their bank book. And so it is that we have churches that take that on out of their budget and UMW and UM men and youth groups and uh, Sunday school classes. And so I thank you for what you have done and, and for what you uh, are about to do. Our scripture reading this day uh, comes from the letter to the Hebrews. The authorship of Hebrews is a little bit uncertain, but its intent is not. It is a great statement of faith, perhaps best known for the Faith Hall of Fame, uh, by faith Abraham, by faith Moses, uh, and by, so on and so on until we get down through that great genealogy of faith to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And after spending most of the first part of this letter speaking about faith in a high abstract theological context, the writer of Hebrews brings it down and brings it home and makes it eminently practical. And here we are toward the end of the book in the 13th chapter, and these are some specific words about how you and I are to demonstrate our faith. Chapter 13, verse 1, let your mutual love continue. Now there's an assumption there, isn't there? That you've already begun loving. That you have been somebody who's loving your neighbor as yourself who is regarding the other as someone who is equal to or better than you, as someone who is giving sacrificially. Some translations say, let your love be constant. And I got to admit, that's a challenge for me. I'm better on February 14th than I am the rest of the days of the year. I remember the flowers in the card because I got a reminder. The constancy is a challenge. But, but here, the author of Hebrews is saying, let your mutual love continue. And then in verse 2, this echo of the passage from Genesis, when Abram and Sarah entertained the angels, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some have entertained angels without knowing it. And because this word is not only rooted in history, but is eternally contemporary, that reference to entertaining angels doesn't mean only those long ago. It means those who are in our midst, whom we may not yet recognize any more than Abram and Sarah did. And in verse 3 is a specific challenge. Remember those who are in prison as if it were you who were in prison. And remember those who are being tortured, as if it were you yourself who is being tortured. And this is the word of God, and we together, the people of God, so we say, thanks be to God. I know that uh, you could tell from the uh, tailored suit and the bow tie that I am from West Virginia. Um, yeah. it, immediately, it, it evoked that image for you. And one of the things that I am is proud to be a mountaineer, which was why my tie is blue and gold. And if there's anybody here who's a graduate of East Carolina, I'll be happy to talk about a couple weeks ago in your visit to Morgantown. <laughs> but one of the things you get used to, uh, sort of, when you're living in West Virginia is being on the bad end of jokes. And, and they are many. They're told mostly by people from Ohio and Pennsylvania, but uh, people elsewhere get in on them as well. One of the ones that I find most brutal and least funny is, how do we know the toothbrush was invented in West Virginia? And the answer to that is, if it were invented anywhere else, it would have been called a teeth brush. You know, now, now, now that, that's just a bad joke. Yeah, one of the jokes that I got to admit I do find a little bit funny uh, came to me online. Of course, nobody tells jokes anymore. We all read them uh, in email or over the internet. 
but it said there's been an episode of CSI, CSI Miami, CSI New York, CSI Las Vegas. Why haven't they done CSI West Virginia? And the answer to that question is the show won't work because there's only one strand of DNA. <laughs> yeah. And now that's a bad joke. Those are part of the stereotypes of what it means to be from West Virginia, and the danger of stereotypes is, of course, that while they may contain some truth, they will conceal deeper and more nuanced truth. And the fact of the matter is, in the small town of West Virginia where I grew up, um, we had a significant immigrant population of Greeks and Italians who had come over uh, to work in the mining communities. And my next door neighbors were Greek, the Katsabarises, and it was entirely possible to live in my hometown and speak only Greek. Uh, there were Greek restaurants, they had a Greek Orthodox church where the uh, worship service was held in Greek, and uh, enough of a community where you didn't really have to learn English, and quite frankly, Ms. Katsabaris never quite mastered English at all. But despite the fact that she couldn't really communicate that clearly in English, Ms. Katsabaris managed to communicate to me uh, more clearly than maybe anybody else I've ever known the meaning of hospitality and love of neighbor. On the other side of us was a family with an older man and a woman, and I knew the mom because she would be in church with us on a regular Sunday basis. The head of the household, uh, the father who was there was somebody that was almost a cipher to us, and it wasn't until I was in my early 20s that I came to understand the reason why he was a severe alcoholic. A functioning alcoholic who managed to go to work but somebody who began drinking as soon as he came home, stayed drunk all weekend, and so the doors to that home were always closed, and she uh, acted in a manner to protect herself and him from embarrassment, all the while hoping he was going to be treated. A couple doors up from that was a, a rather irascible individual. Uh, we, uh, among the stereotypes of West Virginia, is we live on hills. We did, and we do. And uh, in the wintertime, uh, parking was coveted, and it was difficult. And when you would uh, shovel out the space in front of your house, you began to think that uh, you had a proprietary right to it. And this particular individual, to, uh, during the wintertime, if he had shoveled out and somebody would come and park in that space, if it happened to be open, would come running at the door, shaking his fist and screaming. And I'm sure as a child, he did nothing for me other than enlarge my vocabulary. And, and in contrast to these somewhat less than genial and warm neighbors, there was Miss Katsabaris, who was attired the same way every day. She used to wear a house coat. Uh, people did that some. And, and she had an apron on. And we didn't have air conditioning, so frequently the uh, windows and doors were open. But Miss Katsabaris would stand at the door and beckon to anybody in the neighborhood whom she could see and in her rough approximation of the word cousin to show that she thought we were all related, she would say, Koozie, Koozie, you come, you come. And, and she would not rest until you walked in. And then when you went in the house, she was, she was tiny but uh, mighty, in stat or mighty in faith and spirit and, and she would reach up and she would pat my cheek and then she would say some beautiful words of love and affirmation. She would say, oh, Bruce, you smart, you smart. And she was a great judge of character. <laughs> and then and she'd pinch my cheek and she would say, oh, Bruce, you handsome, you handsome. And though she didn't wear glasses, she had perfect eyesight. Yeah. And, and then she would tell me the lie that I love to hear most of all at five foot eight and dreaming of a phone call from the NBA. She would say, Bruce, you tall, you tall. And if you don't mind stretching the truth in God's sanctuary on the way out the door, you can tell me that again. And, 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 I'll, and I'll be happy to hear it another time. But it wasn't enough for her to just love up on you and to affirm you physically. She was going to make sure that you had something to eat. And whatever it is that she was preparing for her family, she was going to put a plate of it out. And I see some of you nodding your head thinking, and that's really nice. And when it was baklava, it was awesome. Uh, when it was squid and ink sauce, uh, or stuffed grape leaves, and some foods that were a little unfamiliar to a young man, it was a little less than an unmitigated blessing. Uh, but still, she was going to make sure that you were fed. And when I think about what we do at our Methodist Home for Children, 
it seems to me that our practice of hospitality, rooted in this letter to the Hebrews, modeled for us by the gracious way that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ welcomed all Jew and Gentile, irrespective of their place of origin, where they were born, or how they appeared. And it seems to me that one of the ways that we live this out really is modeled for us uh, by Ms. Katsabaris. One of the things that we do and is that we stand and we just simply have open arms and open uh, doors and we say, you come, you come. And while nobody can help everybody and no ministry is full service, we're always trying to receive everybody we possibly can into our care. We began a couple of years ago a service that is new not only for North Carolina, but we think is new nationwide. That we began operating three psychological assessment centers for juvenile offenders. It's a voluntary program and they come to us for 14 to 30 days. And then at the end of that time, it is our goal to not only provide the judge before whom they're gonna appear with an accurate portrayal of what's happening within them that's causing this behavior uh, that is so egregious, uh, but also to design a therapeutic alternative so that they can go receive treatment in community instead of being sent off to prison. And there's some uh, great reasons to do this in addition to being the best thing the child, it's the best thing for all of us. You send a teenager off to prison, what are they gonna learn to be? Better criminal? It's criminal college. Uh, you put a child in a therapeutic environment, send them to Methodist home, they get a chance to learn to be a better Christian. Now the youngest child that we have received when we stand and just say, you come into our care is somebody for whom we really were not licensed and somebody for whom we had to stretch because the service is designed for children who are 11 uh, up through age uh, 16. But we received a phone call one night from Billy Lassiter, who's the uh, deputy secretary for the Department of Public Safety. And he has got such a commitment to his job that any time a child younger than 12 uh, c comes into a detention center, he receives a personal phone call. And the phone call said that tomorrow morning at your assessment center that you've got in the Piedmont area, we're bringing you an eight-year-old girl. And how is it that you've got an eight-year-old girl that uh, needs this kind of assessment and has incurred some felony charges? Well, it turns out that she had a classmate that had a snack that she wanted. Classmate did not give it to her. She bided her time and later in the day managed to find a uh, brick, walked up behind the boy, called his name, and she smashed his face and broke his orbital socket in his nose. And eight-year-old girl ought not to be in a detention population. Eight-year-old girl ought not to have to be behind locked doors. And so that night we sprang into action and went and took the locks uh, off the doors of one of the rooms sent staff out to Target so we could get a um, bedspread and some shams uh, that matched and looked inviting and bought some soft toys. And then we went over and above and we hired some staff so that uh, she could be person secure since she wasn't gonna be able to be locked in her room and wanna make sure she was safe and had female staff who would sit outside her door uh, 24 hours a day while she was with us. And we work not only with the child but we're always trying to work with the families of origin and when we sent staff to do an in-home visit they came back and said, we understand exactly why she behaves the way she does. And it's real clear to us where she has learned this dysfunctional, terrible way to resolve conflicts and disputes. And if I could do anything this day, it would be to keep you from otherizing the children in our care and for you not to see them something different because these really are our children and we need to see that with great clarity. And so it is that we stand, and just like Ms. Katsabaris, though we might not speak the same language, though we might have come from some really different places, welcome us in. We stand and welcome in this poor and difficult child. And the second verse here in chapter 13 says, Do not neglect to practice hospitality, for some have entertained angels unawares. And I feel like I am surrounded by angels every day of my life when I'm at Methodist Home for Children. And that would include not just the children and the youth who come into our care, but it would include the staff who care for them. But literally, this was true for me. My very first month on the job, we were um, having lunch, and it's an awesome thing, but Methodist Home for Children has a lifetime commitment to put anybody who's been in foster care, anybody in a group home, anybody who's been adopted through four years of college. You wanna know how remarkable that is? A child has been raised in the foster care system through age 18, is five times more likely at age 22 to have been in a homeless shelter or a jail cell than they are to have been in a chair in a college classroom. It's an incredible intervention. And we're having a lunch to celebrate this and we've got uh, current participants in the program, recent grads, and got some people who are coming in for the first time. I grabbed my plate of barbecue, I got on my name tag, a woman across from me has on her name tag, she's 22 years of age. Her name happens to be 
Angel Taylor. And I sit down across from Angel. I don't know anybody or anything. And I said to her, most general kind of thing, Angel, tell me a bit about yourself. And it was like immediately I had flipped the emotional switch. And Angel pointed across the table. She put her hand right over my hush puppies. You know, she said, I don't mind telling you, but the day I came to Methodist Home, I hated you. And then she stopped and she said, well, not you. You weren't here then. She said, but you know what I mean. She said, I couldn't tell any difference from you and anybody else who tried to take care of me. And then she paused and she said, and I'll also tell you that the day I came to your care, I thought was the worst day of my life. And God made it the best day of my life. And I could tell Angel, well, that's sort of Jesus' job description there, Angel. It's to take the places in our life that are the worst and the most painful and to be present with transformative love and joy. And she said, when I came to Methodist Home, I was 15 years of age. And she said, no one. She said, I put myself at the top of that list. Could see anything good in me except for your staff. And she said, I don't know how, but from the very beginning, they were able to see something in me no one else could. All my life, she said, I had just been told I was stupid. I was more trouble than I was worth. I was never going to amount to anything. She didn't have that experience I had where not only did Bud and Dot Stanley love up on their children and speak beautiful words of love and joy, but that awesome neighbor, Miss Katsabaris, would say, you're smart and you're tall and you're handsome. And all this girl had received her entire life was a torrent of verbal abuse and a beatdown. And she said, I still remember the day when the teacher uh, in the group home put a book in front of me and invited me to open it so we could begin math class. And she said, I took a look at what it said on the top of the book and it said algebra and I pushed it back at her and said, what's this? She said, the teacher pushed the book back in front of me and said, why, it's algebra, Angel. Angel said, I pushed it back to her one more time and said, but you gotta be smart to do algebra. And the teacher again returned the book in front of Angel and said, actually, Angel, you have to be very smart to do algebra. Now open that book and let me show you where to start. And at that point, Angel just started boo-hooing and crying. And she said, can you believe this? I'm going to college. I'm going to college. Maybe I am smart. And it is a beautiful and wonderful thing for us to be able to engage in this ministry of hospitality, for we don't know whom it is that we are entertaining, other than that these are indeed beloved children of God, and therefore they are equal to angels in our sight. And the last thing it says here in Hebrew is a challenging word, is that we are to radically identify with people who are in the most extraordinary circumstances. And when it says, regard those who are being tortured as if it were you yourself who are being tortured, or regard those who are imprisoned as if it were you were yourself who are imprisoned, that is a bold challenge to you and to me. And sadly, these circumstances continue to exist. A few years ago, we took in uh, two young children um, who one time they were discovered uh, had been caged by their mom. Uh, mom was mentally ill unable to care for herself and could not care for them. One had been kept in a dog kennel. Uh, the other had been kept in a crib with a lid on top of it. Uh, so severe was the terms of their confinement that neither one of these children, though they were in age at the, which they should have been able to stand and walk, but they had to receive uh, occupational therapy and other forms of phys physical therapy in order that they might have a, a proper gait. And when those children were placed for the first placement uh, overnight in a home, uh, they were wild, unimaginably wild, screaming and yelling the entire time. And the family with whom we had placed them said uh, the next morning that we just don't think we're going to be able to take this. This is too severe, and we can't handle these children. Well, one of the people who'd come to us for foster parent training happened to be Sonji Carlton. And Sonji and her husband, Alec, were incredibly uh, committed and dedicated. Sonji also happened to be a licensed clinical social worker with a master's degree. And when we described the circumstance and tried to apprise Sanji uh, of exactly how severe these children's behaviors were, Sanji just brushed it off and said, bring those babies to me. Bring those babies to me. And so we took those uh, toddlers to Sanji and to Alec, and immediately uh, they began to flourish and to prosper. And though the intent had not been for Sanji and Alec to adopt, they had intended only to be foster parents and had looked forward to kind of a long ministry doing that, one child after another, they said, look, we've fallen in love with them, and we think that this is their forever family, and we want them to be part uh, of our house. And, and so it is that those, uh, those two beautiful children uh, now bear proudly the name Carlton and have a place where they know good and where they know God. 
And it was all because Alec and Sanji were able to literally uh, live into this word here from Hebrews and regard those who were in such torturous circumstances as if it were they themselves who were enduring that. This is a beautiful word here in the letter of Hebrews about the form that our faith ought to take. And it is our earnest hope and our earnest prayer that we indeed are going to be a model of hospitality, that we're going to stand and say, you come, you come. No matter how bad a shape you're in, no matter how difficult the circumstances, no matter how horrific the background, you come. And that when these children come into our midst, that we're going to whisper words of love and sweetness into their ear. And when they do come into our midst, that we're going to feed them the unfamiliar food of the bread of heaven, the body and blood of Christ, which is as strange to many of them as pastizio was to me all those years ago when it was being offered by Miss Katsabaris. And we're going to lead them into the kingdom of God, into a life of good and of grace, and for the privilege of being part of this ministry with all you who are here at Ann Street. I stand here this day and say thank you and amen. Won't you stand and let us sing together as responders? 445, 445. could we know, O oh God, all that you are doing unless we tell of your marvelous works? We tell of how you are touching and changing lives and this whole creation and reconciling it to yourself, one spirit and soul at a time. We thank you for the lives transformed and the lives yet to be transformed by our partners at Methodist Home for Children. We pray that you will move over uh, their ministries with such providence and care uh, that you will uh, loosen the grip that we hold uh, to what is, uh, what is ours and what we see as uh, only for some people and loosen it to be for all people, not only individually, but as a state, as, as partners with Methodist Home. Uh, we thank you for Bruce and for his, uh, his, his faithful word and uh, the way that you uh, bring his message across our state and all the way over here to Beaufort, and we give you thanks. We pray for these that we have remembered today in name and in thought, uh, those who are known to us as individuals and those who... Uh, we may never meet, but pray for, nonetheless, the, those suffering in uh, natural disasters uh, across this land and, and others, uh, those deployed in, in service across the world. Uh, we thank you for protecting them. 
We pray for uh, uh, the ministries and the life together that we offer before you, uh, from partnerships like this one to uh, the flood buckets and the disaster response, and all the many ways that you are showing us how to be your faithful disciples. Bless these that we bring before you. Guide us in service and help us to remember that you are the one who said to us, you come, come. And we will be faithful to follow the one who said, follow me, and to pray as he taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I do want to uh, put before you the uh, idea of the 1K for one kid. Uh, it's a, a very popular way to look at uh, how to support these children and the ministries of Methodist Home. Uh, it may be that, as Bruce said, that some can, uh, can make that commitment and, um, and, and offer that $1,000 uh, level. Others uh, do other levels as, as the Spirit moves and as, the, as opportunity allows. Uh, and, uh, but frequently, I see uh, classes and groups who come together and say, well, if we put our resources together, we think our Sunday school class or our, uh, our group, our ministry area, could, uh, could, could commit to that. So I'll offer that back before you again as you make your gifts and offerings. What we offer to God and to the church uh, first is our tithes uh, to the local church. But we don't just say our tithes here. We talk about gifts and offerings. And so uh, we bring all of that before God. Uh, and we invite the uh, ushers and acolyte to come forward and assist us. Everybody need a little 